Okay, so um, this is a this is a panel. This is actually a panel on a wall in a room. This is a panel. Um, this is one of the panels on the walls of the Farnese Palace in Rome um, that was uh, created by the Borgia Pope um, Alexander the Sixth. Um, and um, this the painter is Pinturicchio, and um, and Alexander the Sixth himself is in this picture. So that's him there on the left without his triple crown, basically uh, prostate in front, not oh, prostrate rather, <laughs> not prostate, <laughs> prostrate in front of uh, the savior, um, et cetera. But so since the ninth house is the house of religion and um, and it's the joy of the sun and note, uh, note what Jesus is looking like here. Basically, Jesus, one of the things that no one ever says, but that we should always take into account is that Jesus is essentially a sun god. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of heaven, the manna from heaven, right? So um, as ultimately what we have here um, is Jesus as the center of the sun, all the rays that are around him. Even the halo is an expression of the heavenly or divine or heavenly light. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we're going to be kind of coming into this idea of the ninth house and the sun and uh, holiness and religion, <clears throat> which even kind of dovetails away from our con or into our conversation that we were having last year, uh, last week on Thursday about, um, you know, what, what era is more spiritual versus what era is more religious. Oh, here's a Ryan, lovely. Another person from the clubhouse Thursday, fantastic. So we're just getting started and wonderful. Welcome, Ariah. Great to see you. Oh, and by the way, Ariah makes um, Zodiac sense. So we can talk about that a little bit, bit later, but um, she mentioned that on Thursday. Um, so that that might be a cool thing to um, get in touch with her about. Um, anyway, but so we were basically talking about the ninth house as the joy of the sun, um, which then puts, of course, the connection with it being called God. And we were talking about Jesus as a sun god and how obviously Jesus in this particular panel by Pinturicchio is being um, is being featured as, as a sun god, as the center of the sun. All right. And so even it's even called the temple of the sun. So we're going through the usual format, which is from the beginning to the end, um, kind of sticking. And this time I didn't put in as many... Um, descriptive things. We'll talk maybe more, I'll just bit, maybe more talk description. I didn't put as many uh, descriptive things by Deborah Holding in, but um, but still uh, this, this is from Deborah Holding. And what I love about this wonderful book, um, which is called The Houses, Temples of the Sky, um, is that she goes all the way from the beginning of our tradition, which is really the Hellenized Egyptian tradition, and she comes to the modern. So she, but she really gives us the origins behind why the houses are as they are. Hey, Lila. Um, so destiny and decrees of the gods, right? So remember that in Jochish, the ninth house is called the, a house of fortune. And it's still considered one of the seven beneficial places um, when we talked about um, accidental dignity and houses that are strong. The ninth, the ninth house is the weakest of the strong houses temple of the sun travel right so that's what we really know the um, the ninth house to be long distance travel especially when you know, we think of the third house with short distance travel or short um short journeys or journeys by road and the ninth house is journey over sea right so and it's interesting that the main part or arabic lot arabic part or egyptian lot for um, long journeys is taking, um, I think, taking the moon to the cusp of the of fifteen Cancer, right? Remember, remembering that the moon and Cancer rule the oceans, and you would be going doing long tr distance travel by water. You'd be doing it over the water. So they're all they all have to do with these watery issues. Here comes Klutze. Oh, good, we got a really nice biggish class today. Travel, God, manifestations of the gods. God, there's God. Manifestations of the gods. Revelation, soothsaying. Friendship of and benefit from kings. Now, remembering also that the Hellenistic period put your father and the king in the ninth house. And right now, the father is still in the ninth house in Jyotish, right? We use the father, we use the fourth house for the father um, in traditional Western astrology. 
Formicus, which brings us what to the second century is religion, foreign travel, the social class of men, the house of the sun god, favorable because it aspects the ascendant by trine. Of course, anything that remembering that the ascendant rep, and the angles themselves represent different refractions and powers of light. Right, that's where the light is at its most most powerful and can project itself furthest into whichever realm it's supposed to be projected, right? The light in the east, it's projected into the world. At sunrise, it's projected out for everybody to see. At at um what sunset, or not sunrise, at um what is it, at high noon, everybody can see it. At sunset, then everybody can see whatever happens to the sun when it goes down, and then it um lights China at midnight, right? Remember how it was that we believe that the sun went and um, lit the other hemisphere while, while we slept. Um, okay, so for travel, the social class of men, the house and son of God, house of the sun God, <laughs> house of the son of God, favorable because it aspects the ascendant by trine. We've talked about that. Once again, planets that aspect the, the ascendant um, give are given are given and give support so they're given support by the ex, by the light that the ascendant represents and they give support to the ascendant by um adding power to its light um travel religion fate attainment of knowledge from the, this is Abiruni, so we're now in the in the middle medieval islamic period which is really our jam here travel religion fate attainment of knowledge from the stars and divination philosophy interpretation of dreams now we come to what we start to know the ninth house to be connected with until this 18th century 19th century pretty much this is what it what it, it the ninth house represents travel religion fate now that's in, once again coming from this idea of fortune but also coming from the idea of the sun as as being able to give you fate or the attainment of what you want attainment of knowledge the ninth house is called the house of knowledge from the star and from the stars of divination and divination philosophy remember remembering that by this time astrology is considered a natural science so it's a type of knowledge to be attained philosophy and and, and also that astrology was based on the philosophers of old neoplaton the neoplatonists were astrologers Aristotelians were, were astrologers. When we looked at the whole idea of finding the soul in the chart, we used Aristotle's concept of the three powers of the soul. And that was what the, the astrological technique was based on. So the ninth house still has this connection with astrology and divination, because remember the sun is the eye in the sky. It's the all seeing eye and the sun represents divination the sun represents healing it's apollo who gave the caduceus to mercury it's the sun that represents vitality and life it's the sun that is god and that is worshiped right it's the so all of these things remembering what we were talking about when we were talking about the joys of the houses that or the joys of the planets rather was that the joys of the planets are houses where the significations are similar or almost exactly the same venus is in her joy in the fifth house because the fifth house has the same significations as venus so that no matter what sign she's in when she's in the fifth she gets that boost because she's in a house that reflects her significations same thing for the sun and the ninth foreign lands long journeys, so we're in Lily in the 17th century, faraway places, religion, clergy, dreams, vision, learning. Dreams, visions, learning. This thing about the interpretations of dreams, <coughs> I have a dream, <coughs> said Martin Luther King. No, I have a dream that, um, I, have, I have a very important dream that I had and that I actually um, asked Vedic astrologers to help me with. And so I thought that um, I would bring that dream forward today and we can look at the chart for the dream and uh, and base it kind of on this particular um on this particular uh, form way of looking at dreams there's not a lot of information on how to delineate dreams there's not a lot but there is but def definitely they're supposed to belong to the ninth now here's the thing 
Ben Dyck says that they belong to the third house, but I haven't seen anything that connects to that. So I'm, I'm just going to, we're going to continue con looking at the ninth house for dreams. And when we get to my dream chart, we're going to look at that for dreams. Okay, so higher, and then now we come, notice that as we come into the closer to this uh, period, into our period, um, long distance travel starts to be really focused on as opposed to religion. And so things of a foreign nature, long distance travel and things that are foreign, right? By the time we get into the modern, there's nothing to do with religion at all. Higher education, travel, foreigners, languages, moral ideas, conscience, dreams. Why is that? It's because of the zodiac alphabet. It's because people are equating Sagittarius with the ninth house, right? Which is a relatively new development, you know, 500, 600 years, a relatively new development. Um, or maybe really more like 400 years, maybe, yeah, more like 400, because Lily, it, you start to see it with Lily. You see it earlier, maybe, maybe with Scherner, you start to see it, but he's 16th century. So once again, 400, 400 years. Okay. <laughs> now we come into the 8th century, 7th, 8th, 8th, 9th century of Alcabezi and Alberuni. The ninth out of travel and pilgrimage. Oh, wait, I think I might have, hold on a sec. Yeah, sorry. We missed Vedius Valens. So Vedius Valens is one of my favorite. His uh, anthology is one of my favorite books. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's difficult to get through, um, but there's so much inf interesting information. It's from the first, from the second century, and one of the best, maybe first century. But one of the best things about it is that there are chart, um, there there are charts that he delineates, and he talks about his process in a, sim in a similar way that we do here. Oh wait, do we have questions? Why third? I have no idea. <clears throat> I have no, I have no real idea. I, I saw it, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, we can look at it and see when we get to this, when we get to the chart. So um, this is Valens. And like I said, the reason I like Valens is because he was a practicing astrologer and he was in the thick of it and talking about what worked and what didn't. Um, if beneficence happen to be in this place and have been assigned the ascendant or fortune, right? Because we use the part of fortune as an ascendant, the native will be blessed, reverent, a prophet of great God. So, once, so prophecy, divination, God, bless, blessedness. There's fortune. In fact, he will be obeyed like a god. There's that kingship aspect. If beneficence are not there, and if Mercury alone is an aspect, the native will be involved in soothsaying. Once again, going back to divination and prophecy, he will expound his craft to the masses. Now, I have Mercury as the ruler of the ninth on the ascendant, and I read astrology charts, and read tarot, and do numerology, and and played around with psychic with psychic mediumship. He, and do healing. I do I do Reiki and I do massage. So all the ninth house stuff, I'm all about it. He will become a royal clerk from his middle years. But if and but if malefics are in conjunction and rule the previously mentioned places, the ascendant and fortune, or if they are an aspect from the right with the lot. Now we talked about Dexter aspects versus versus sinister aspects because that's what he's talking about the native will be a tyrant he will found some cities he will sack others he will plague many people most wickedly so basically they're saying they're saying on the first paragraph the person will be very good what what, what are the conditions to make the person a benevolent uh, benevolent ruler and in the second if they come to you know some kind of great height and in the second it's what makes them into um, a tyrant so once again we can still see this connection with um, the ninth house and rulership and and kingship, because once again, <clears throat> the highest authority in the land is the king, <clears throat> unless you unless it's Rome. <clears throat> so the ninth that and that's been the main most important and difficult struggle, the investiture struggle. We talked about that, and that's an important thing to be thinking about here, and and the fact that the ninth house involves it. Now, the ninth house involves what we're talking about. The investiture struggle is a historic period in the, um, in papal history um, and in the history of the Holy Roman Empire, which in, at that time was Italy and Germany. And um, we're talking about the uh, 12th century. Really, the height of it is the, the fight between Alexander III, Pope Alexander III, and Frederick Barbarossa. <clears throat> and so that's the mid 12th century. And that this and basically the fight it was about who gets to decide who the bishops are, 
who gets to invest the power of a bishop? Is it is it Rome? Because of course Rome is the source of all things. It's the third, the twelfth century now. Rome is the source of all, of all religious of understanding and belief, and thus it should be and the highest authority in Christendom because Christendom Christendom is a thing. So the highest authority in Christendom is the Pope, right? So thus he's the one who should be appointing bishops. But in a person's land, in France, in England, in Germany, um, in and even though Germany is the Holy Roman um, Empire, it's got an emperor. So shouldn't the emperor be able to invest the power to appoint a bishop? So the bishops are ruled by the ninth house. Popes are ruled by the ninth house. In Hellenistic astrology, when we go far enough back, kings are ruled by the ninth house, the right divine right of kings. The divine ninth house, right of kings, ninth house, right? So as we come into this medieval period, into this Islamic medieval, medieval period, then we move the king into the 10th house. He becomes the sun at high noon. But in this older period, the kings in the ninth, right? Remember the other word for the third house is goddess and queen, right? So the kings in the ninth, his wife, the queen is in the third. And we even saw, we were looking at movie queens. Remember when we did the third house and I said, there was all this stuff that I kept seeing in movie queens houses and movie goddesses houses and movie goddesses charts, right? And that was all about the third house. We got to see that up close, Marilyn Monroe, Greta Garbo, all those people. <clears throat> okay, so the ninth, that of pilgrimage. So we're now in the medieval period, Islamic medieval period, that of travel and pilgrimage, laws and divine contemplation, philosophy and the arts, writing and visions, and rumors and visions, although rumors are supposed to be a part of the third house. So I find that interesting. And here, Alcabezi, the ninth house of pilgrimages and travels, faith and religion, wisdom, philosophy and books, also letters and legates. Remember the fifth house, we had letters and legates, reports and dreams, and it signifies the beginning of the of the second half of life. And Al Andargar said, the first lord of the triplicity of the house of pilgrimage signifies pilgrimage and everything which happens on it. The second one signifies faith and religion and the good state of those of things in their manner. And the third one is significator of wisdom and dreams. One of the Laylas has been to Mecca. Which one is that? Neither has been to Mecca? No, I consider it... Um... How do you say disrespectful? Because I'm not religious. Okay, but uh, Leila Akbar, have you been to Mecca? No, I think that was some other girl named Fatima who joined our Fat session. That's yeah. right, Fatima. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't know. Um, I have been on pilgrimage. I think Diana, Diana, who isn't with us, she's done. She's a a, a pagan and she's done a druid pilgrimage. So I've got I've done pilgrimage. So that's something interesting to to seize. Um, so the first triplicity ruler representing pilgrimage. Does anybody remember the planet that is the natural significator for pilgrimage? Either of the Laylas? I think it's Mars. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Both of you. Fantastic. <laughs> Why? <clears throat> Well, because in the olden times, pilgrimage was a big deal and it used to be filled with hurdles and hardships. So it's the natural significator, Mars. Perfect. Mars yeah, exactly. I think there's another aspect of it too, is that um, in order to go on a long distance journey, you have to get over your fear of the unknown. You have to not be afraid to go somewhere that you don't know. I remember actually when I lived in Thailand, a friend of mine was going to come and visit and he, he decided instead to go, I don't know, maybe it was Bali or something like that. And he said, um, he goes, um, he goes, you know, I was going to come see you. He goes, but I know how it works in such and such. I don't know how it works in Thailand. And so that was kind of a, the ninth house thing is that he'd have to, he'd have to come and get the lay of the land. And remember we talked about, now here's a connection with Jupiter, in my opinion, with Jupiter and dominion. This idea of with Jupiter and this idea of making dominion over something unfamiliar or, or dominion over something that you didn't previously have. That's an aspect of Jupiter, 
not specifically the ninth house. But when we connect this idea of Jupiter in the ninth house, then there's this idea of the taming the familiar. You know, this idea of Sagittarius, this is why Spain is considered a Sagittarius country, is because it had all of these adventurers and, and travelers who discovered the new world, who created dominion over new territory. And there is Jupiter as the ruler of Sagittarius, which then we connect with the ninth house as well. Rulership, no, for, for Spain, no, no, for Spain, no. It would be, for, um, no, for Spain, it would not be Taurus. Taurus is Ireland. If you, if you know what, if you go in, if you look into the, um, remind me, we'll do it later. When we look into the um, lily, if we look to the lily, we'll see, yes, yeah, Spain's not Taurus. Spain is definitely Sagittarius. Okay, so um, ninth house of pilgrimage, because we got that, faith and religion, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so first triplicity ruler is pilgrimage. Second triplicity ruler is faith and religion and the good state of these things in their manner. And the third one is the wisdom and dreams, also stars and omens. So we'll look at that third triplicity ruler when we get to my, um, when we get to my dream chart. Now here's Benati. Now he's filling out, of course, the compiler. So he's got a lot of different viewpoints, but he's filled it out a little bit with some of his own stuff too. So Omar of Tiberius said, ninth house is that of faith and religion and a long journey. Atta'ullah said that it signifies wisdom and vision and the culture of the deity and all houses of religion and the foreknowledge of things. And al Kabizi said that it signifies wisdom, philosophy, writing, right? We've already seen al Kabizi what he had to say, the legates, the narration of future things, dreams. Um, uh, so narration of future things, that's a little bit different from what we saw, actually saw in al Kabizi. And it signifies the middle of life. And Saul said that the ninth house is cadent from the angle of the 10th, which of course it is. And I say that it signifies reputation according to how it and its Lord are disposed. Now, doesn't that usually, isn't that usually connected with the 10th? Reputation. Isn't that interesting? So like I said, he has his own little um, idea about it. For if the Lord of the ninth house were of good condition and well disposed, and there were benefics in it, namely like Jupiter or Venus or the head of the dragon, and they were free nor impeded, it signifies the reputation of the native and his great honor. So have we been looking all this time? I've been talking about the 10th house's reputation, 10th house is your reputation, 10th house is your reputation. Should we be looking at this instead for reputation? Like, you know what I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the Leona Helmsley chart out. She, she's called the queen of mean. Her reputation is for being very, very mean, even though she's publicly a public figure for being a very wealthy person. We were just looking at Leona Helmsley and the Vedic astrology thing today. Um, I used that chart, but we're gonna use her chart today. Um, and see if we can see ninth house for if we've been looking at the wrong thing. See, Esther, this is how we do it. We come in and we, talk, we, we come in and we look at these things and we say, oh, really, do we think this is the case? And then we go, okay, well, let's look at a chart and see if we like that or not. And that's how we do it. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that if you remember Layla Akbar, and I think Kabir, you were with us too. When we looked at the ninth house, we realized that the ninth house was the only, and this actually feeds into once again, what you and I were talking about, Esther. We found that the only house in all of this, in the entire thing that we actually needed to kind of switch things around and look at things a little bit differently in order to modernize, the only house that needed to be modernized was the ninth house nothing else and so this so it's it's one one kind of interesting thing because on some level it does is on some level it supports what you were saying about it being a more spiritual time and on another level it doesn't support what you were saying about hey you know we're in a different time how would that stuff still be relevant right because you said both things and what we found was that we didn't find a technique that wasn't relevant what we did find was a framing that was no longer relevant, but only in the ninth house. Is that correct, Layla? Layla Akbar? Because you were with, I know you were right there with me. I recall that. Yeah. But no other house. There was no other place where we needed to say, hey, we've got to make a concession. Times are different. Is that correct? No, 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 no. Just the ninth house. Okay. 
So that's my so that's my point to you, Esther, is that that particular this particular detail, as I said, confirms maybe a little bit of what you're saying about this being a more spiritual time, but it also doesn't confirm what you were saying about it may not be relevant because of how long ago all this stuff came about. Because we found that all of these techniques, 99% of these techniques that we've looked out looked at have been 100% on the money. Well, I, 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 would, I would like to correct because I think I expressed myself in the wrong way. I would say that if we, are, we are living in a more spiritual time. I would say it's more, um, it's more about consciousness, you know, um, the, the importance of, of, of the, the awareness of the importance of, 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 a con of consciousness is quite different. I mean, this, this is what I meant by spiritual. I don't mean this woo woo and this uh, esoteric things. That's a good point. That's an important distinction, Esther. I, th I think that's a very good point because I think if anything, if anything actually um, characterizes the last 150 years, it's the discovery of consciousness, right? It's the discovery of the unconscious as an actual entity and thing to be reckoned with, um, of the subconscious mind, the unconscious, the collective unconscious, all of these, the discovery of psychology generally. Right, which is basically kind of, which is now what as, most astrology feeds into. It's basically, it basically is kind of, I call it now stellar, stellar psychology. It's basically kind of just another um, psychological tool. Whereas all of this precedes the, I won't say invention, the discovery of psychology. Right, so the, the discovery of psychology is a 19th century discovery. We're 600 years prior with Bonatti here. So I think you're absolutely correct. This idea of, of consciousness. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? <laughs> I would also add. I mean, and uh, um, of course, I have done a lot of psychology, but um, um, some some years ago, I decided to to go away from from psychology. That's maybe why I'm so attracted now to go back to the Hellenistic and the old uh, astrology, because I feel that the world as it is now. Uh, uh, um, psychology does not work anymore. It has become a really Saturnian consensus uh, instrument, you know? I mean, and you understand, I don't say this is not that, that astrology, is not, that uh, psychology is not worth anything. Of course, it has its merits, but it does, the world is easy, it doesn't, the collective has become more important uh, for me, and, and all the, the themes connected with it, and then, then the, the merely Freudian psychology, psychological approach. I, very, I mean, this is a completely separate discussion, right, mind you, um, which is, I think, also very important, a very important distinction about what we're, about where consciousness is, where we are um, uh, as, for, as a culture, as a world culture spiritually. Um, so um, I'm going to leave that section and go back. But all of this is ninth house because we're talking philosophically. Right. So we're still in the we're still in the ninth house arena with this discussion, even though we've moved all of a sudden just kind of a little bit to the side. Right. So this discussion we're having is ninth house. Yeah. And very good point, Layla. It's important because it's part of why astrology is trendy now. You know, ultimately, astrology, the way that it's treated right now, it's treated like Myers-Briggs. It's just another it's just another personality test. And you can tell because most people on Reddit say, I'm trying to learn about myself. No one says I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to learn astrology better. People say I'm trying to learn myself better. Right. And so that's how we know the difference between learning astrology and learning self and learning stellar psychology, so to speak. So we're 100 percent with you with the turning away from. Not, not that psychology is not useful, but turning away from it as a dominant paradigm for astrology. Okay, and here's Schoener from the 16th century, and the ninth house for him, named God. In this house, we seek piety, truth, the sects of mankind, long journeys, wisdom, divination, philosophy, and the interpretation of dreams. It rules Chaim, oh, I don't know, what is that? I wondered, Chaim, the liver, the hips, and with the buttocks, co-significator Jupiter, 
right? So it really should be the son there. As a matter of fact, nine and 11, those two should be switched, right? Because Jupiter- I think he's using the alphabet, my bro. He is, no. but, yeah. but, it doesn't, but, it, but it doesn't work for the 11th. No, I'm not saying it works at all. I'm saying, oh, not for the 11th, but look at the 12th. That's Pisces, right? Wait, what's Pisces, happening but you, first though? But you, I don't right, know. See, see it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a hodgepodge. Who he's doing a hodgepodge, but but we don't agree. But we do not agree. That's a, <laughs> uh, that was what this wonderful Jyotishi, my very first Jyotish reading. This wonderful woman from India, she was visiting family in California, and um and I had oh it was my second reading, and I had had another reading by another guy, and he had used Raman Ayanamsha. So you know there's if you don't know about Ayanamsha, then I'm not I'm not going to go off on it. But he used a different Ayanamsha than the usual, the Lahiri. And so I I mentioned to this woman, I said oh so um I just had a, a, a reading with an astrologer with uh with um the Raman. She goes oh Dr. Raman and I we do not agree. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh so we do not agree with Scherner, but we like Scherner because he's very creative and he's he's doing and he's he's doing his own thing and he's doing it very creatively. And when we get to our mutants and compound our mutants and that kind of shit, then we love him because he puts a lot of that stuff together. Ninth house, Lily. So now we're in the 17th century. Now we're in the, the early modern era. <laughs> By this house, we give judgments of voyages and long journeys. Beyonces, a religious man or clergy of any kind, where bishops or inferior ministers, dreams, visions, foreign countries, books, learning, church livings, or benef beneficence, avowsons, whatever that means, of the kindreds of one's wife. That's the third from the seventh, right? So the wife's brothers and sisters. Of colors, it has the green and white. Uh, remembering that these, so the different, how the colors kind of work with the houses. Of man's body, it rules the fundament. So that rules the, the butthole or the, the so uh, the hips, it would, would rule the anus, although the anus usually is Scorpio. So I wonder what he means by fundament. It might mean the sits bones themselves because, oh, that makes sense because the sits bones are where the hip joint meets the, the, the glute, you know, meets the, the hip, you know, where the, the actual thigh bone comes into the hip. So that makes perfect sense. Um, the hips because of hips and thighs. Sagittarius and Jupiter are co-significators of this house. See, now there he is using the alphabet. For if Jupiter be herein, place that makes uh, naturally signifies a devout man in his religion. And remember, we talked about that in the traditional astrology course when we talked about the ninth house, about how we learned that really Jupiter is itself himself is not really spirituality. Jupiter is piety. Jupiter is the obedient, pious is obedience and piety that follows the law and as a result is given um is given benefit or as a result is uh, rewarded so jupiter is is the piety the virtue uh, you, you know the term virtue is its own reward that's the essence of jupiter so Ju virtue jupiter is the virtue and jupiter is the reward for the virtue at the same time I have often observed when the dragon's tail or Mars or Saturn have been unfortunately placed in this house, the querent has either be little better than an atheist or a desperate sectorist. The sun rejoices to be in this house, which is masculine and Caden. And then I think the last thing we look at <coughs> is we look at Scherner's lists of what to look at when we're trying to figure things out. And so we've been doing this recently with the last few houses. And so what he says to consider is look at the ninth house and its Lord, the part of religion and its Lord, the part of fortune and its Lord, the part of fortune, the part of future things, right? That's the part of spirit, which makes perfect sense because that's called the part of the sun or the, the ascendant of the sun. The second triplicity Lord of the third house, which is the, which is the older brothers or sisters. Now, isn't that weird? Another... It's weird how he brings in some of these weird triplicity rulers that don't make any fucking sense. Like he did with, with the fifth house. He brought in the third triplicity ruler of the of the 11th, which didn't make any sense either. So this second triplicity lord of the third doesn't make sense. But the second triplicity lord of the ninth does because that's the religion. That's specific to the religion and faith. Okay. And then we're going to look at this. So basically what he's saying, it's kind of a, a it's kind of an easy, uh, it's his easy, what shall I say, kind of cookbook approach to dreams. So he says, basically, if in a dream chart, 
Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon is the Lord of the dream, then the dream will be about these things, right? So if Saturn, it's about the dead, will come concerning the dead, crying, demons, tombs, right? So that's if you have a chart, it's like you've got a horror, you had a really amazing or, or important dream, a dream, like I call them big dreams. <clears throat> you wake up from a big dream. <clears throat> And you do a horary trying to figure out what it's about, then this is what what you would do. This is not something necessarily specifically you would find in natal in the natal chart, right? Because we have all kinds of dreams, all kinds of times, right? <clears throat> it wouldn't say now what would be interesting. Let's say you're a person who's prone to night terrors. Maybe we might be able to see that kind of thing from the ninth, ninth house or from the third triplicity ruler of the ninth house, which also represents dreams. So something to think about. Long distance travel. So on one side, we've got the considerations and on the other side, we've got the things to make the Almutant, the compound Almutant, which is something we've been playing with recently. I don't think we're gonna do it this week, <clears throat> but, um, but it has been fun to look at. And so what I thought I'll just talk about what, it, what an Almutant means. Um, uh, we've, we've talked about it in almost every single video at this point so that's a good that's a good thing so it kind of keeps keep getting reinforced the word al mutant comes from the arabic word al muqtaz and al muqtaz means the winner or the victor the person who wins um the one who wins and it's because the um islamic medievalists they created a scoring system based on um the uh, based on the sign that a planet the sign and degree that a planet was in and so there um they gave five different essential dignities places in which a sign was dignified um and each five was you know consecutively weaker right so there's the strongest dignity which is domicile then the next strongest is ex exaltation then the next is triplicity then the next is term then the least is face right and so there was a planet that ruled each of those essential dignities. And so based on what plant, based on what, where that planet was, it got a certain amount of points. So let's say, <clears throat> let's say we're talking about um, three degrees of Libra. In Libra, we have Venus is the ruler, the domicile ruler, Saturn is the exaltation ruler. As a matter of fact, oh no, okay, I won't do it now. I'll come back. We'll come back to it later. We'll come back to this later when we get to looking at charts. Um, but Saturn is the exaltation ruler. If it's daytime, Saturn also owns the triplicity. If um, he also rules the term because he rules the first six degrees of 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 air of uh, Libra, and then um, whoever rules the face, the first and face is another word for decan or deaconate, right? So as a result, even though Saturn isn't the ruler per se of Libra, he might be the winner and get the most points in the in his particular degree of of Libra. And so that's where the uh, concept of Almutin, it's the Almutin is the planet who has the most points in the degree that we're talking about. So if we're talking about 15 degrees of cancer, which planet gets the most points in that? That's the Almubtaz or Almutin, right? Although we know that the moon is the ruler of cancer, she might not be the winner. So that's how we look at Almutas. So just as we look at an Almutan of one point, right? 15 degrees cancer was the, the example I just gave. We can look at an Almutan over many points, right? We can look at the Almutan, right? Because we're basically just plotting points for a degree. Because, right? That's all we're doing. So that means we could, instead of using one point, we could use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, this particular one used seven cusp of the ninth house and its lord. So let's say 15 cancer were on the cusp of the ninth, then its lord would be the moon. So we would use 15 cancer, we would then use also the degree of the moon. Let's say there was a planet in the ninth house at 21 cancer, then we would put 21 cancer. Then we would find the degree that Mars, let's say Mars is at 18 Capricorn, then we would put 18 Capricorn. And then we would find the part of journeys. And let's say part of journeys was in Libra, 
then we would put eight Libra or whatever that is. And then we would put Venus, right? Because that would be Libra's Lord. And then we would look for the first triplicity Lord of the ninth. It's daytime and it's a water sign. So we would then put Venus again. So that's how, that's how we would look at it. And so every single degree we would then list and then we would find the points. Now we did this in the last one. Like I said, we we might do it later. We, we maybe we'll do it when we actually get to the joint chart. Some of the charts we actually might do it later. But I just thought I would kind of you know it might me talking about it might be more confusing than um, than useful. But know that basically these are the three different areas: long distance travel, dreams. And religion. Now, there's more than three areas, right? Because um, there is also, um, it's called the house of wisdom and, or the house of knowledge. Um, and often one of the important horary questions are usually, um, can I get the philosopher's stone? Will I attain the philosopher's stone? Right. And to attain the philosopher's stone, that means that you need to have been you, your knowledge needs to be correct and the application of your knowledge needs to be correct so that you get this correct effect. And so basically, shall I attain to the to the philosopher's stone is is my knowledge. Do I have all the knowledge I need? Do I do is my knowledge together? Right. So that's the ninth house as the house of long distance travel, the house of religion and faith the house of dreams and prophecy and divination and the house of knowledge and education. Remember that Bonatti says that the, that the ninth house is all teachers and all students. Okay, good. So we stop the share for a second. Now I'm gonna come to, oh, perfect. Here's Leona Helmsley. <clears throat> what about law? Now, interesting. Remember what we saw last time? We saw that um, we saw that the I thought always thought that the ninth house was law, right? But and its ninth house is judges. But we saw that the tenth house was also. So it looks like the ninth and the tenth house have both been connected to judges and law. So. I want to test out what Bonatti said about your about the ninth house being your reputation. So the ruler of the ninth in this chart, Leona Helmsley is known for being arrogant and abusive and mean, the queen of mean, um, firing people nonchalantly and casually. Does this Jupiter in the second show that in your opinion i think so note that jupiter rules the ninth and the tenth in this chart so if we were using a whole side chart and mars were the ruler mars would be the ruler of the ninth jupiter would be the rule i mean rule of the tenth jupiter would be the ruler of the ninth which in your opinion does mars or does jupiter show the kind of reputation this person has as abusive and mean and uh, aggressive. Oh, there's aggressive. That means Mars. Yeah, I think Mars is fallen in Libra, so that would be more malefic. Yeah, I think so too. And also the fact that the Venus is well, the Venus is Casimir. How is this Casimir Venus working? Uh, people let him get let let her get away with it. Well, if we looked at this from a whole sign perspective, once again, then Venus would be the ruler of the fourth and the 11th. And would be in first. And would be in the first. And mm -hmm. which means that Venus rules houses and buildings and homes. This woman was the top real estate in Manhattan before she married her third husband and became the hotel queen. Right, so this person became a queen of hotels. And then the 11th house, of course, is, is us getting to the top, right? So there's the Kazimi, we can see with the 4th and the 11th that this person, the gains, this person, by the, by the time her third husband died, she was a billionaire. Five, she, she inherited $5 billion, or rather assets worth $5 billion. Well, wait, 8th house. So wait, that's 8th house, though, too. So that would be what, the last duplicity ruler of the 8th house, which is... Jupiter. Oh, bam. There he is in the second. 
But this Casimi Venus, 11th house is a house of gain, a house of getting my future wishes, right? So probably that, and, and that the future wishes may have something to do with, with real estate, with luxury, right? She was the luxury, she was the queen of luxury hotels. Wait, so it's showing ruler of the ninth being Jupiter in the second. So her belief system is possessions, is money. Or rat, well, it could be certainly around that, but we were talking about looking at the ninth house as reputation, right? Because we ah, just okay. saw because we just saw Bonatti talk about that. And so can't we're and so my point is, do we think that the ninth house is the rep is the reputation? This woman has a reputation for being mean. As we talked about in um, as we talked about in um this morning when we looked at her chart. It even she went to jail because the stories about how abusive she was turned off the ju the jurors so much that they weren't clement. They didn't have mercy on her, and she ended up going to jail. Good. So, which planet do we think shows the reputation more? Does the Mars and Libra? Now, Mar I mean, I've known a lot, like my best friend is Mars and Libra. He's not, he's not mean and difficult at all. As a matter of fact, he has difficulty. He has difficulty with. Ten. Ah, you're reading a whole sign. I get it. Okay. Right. So I'm saying if, if, What's because of what I'm saying is this, I'm saying that if we've been, we, we've been to all this time saying that the 10th house is, is reputation. Well, it is. But, but, but not well, but Bonatti just said the ninth house is reputation. So we're looking at it from a whole sign perspective because here the ninth and 10th house are ruled by the same planet. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at it from a whole sign perspective to see, okay, well, which planet is the reputation? Which planet is? Now, obviously, if you have a reputation for being abusive, what planet does that actually Im imply? Mars. Mars. Yeah. Mars. But... Yeah, I don't know. I kind of see it both ways. Okay. I think whole sign gives you information. I think, what did you use, Reggie? No, Alcabicious gives you inf information too. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm not saying either or. I'm basically saying because we don't have a choice, I'm making one. That's oh, all. Okay. <clears throat> this, this, this chart didn't give us a, cho a, ch a choice to look at two different planets. To see but that's, maybe that's the point. Maybe maybe her what she's known for in her belief system, the ninth and the tenth are the same. Got it. So she's known for so basically that the that the reputation is as a result of her belief system is what you're yep. saying. Yeah, could be. <clears throat> ah, and so maybe here's the ah, maybe see, but it's uh, still there's there's still a disconnect for me because. Okay. My point, no, 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 not your, no, but it's not what, it's not along with what you said. It's a different one. Because if indeed the 10th house is proxis, right? Your action, what you do, the works for which you're known, right? The, what you, the decisions you make and the works for which you're known. Maybe the ninth house beliefs, obviously your beliefs inform your actions, Right? Your beliefs inform your actions. If we've learned anything in this post-Trump era is that information doesn't matter. It's what people believe that matters. Yep. Right? The truth is more important than the facts. Well, or the what we believe to be true is more important than what we know to be the facts. Yep. Thus, but that's what that isn't a reputation. A reputation <laughs> is something you're known for outside, visibly. This person was known for being ab abusive and mean and uh, um, and material, well, certainly known for being materialistic and luxurious. Yeah. Yes. yeah. In her Which time, yes. Do not doubt you. Do not fucking doubt you at all. When I grew up, if I heard the name Leona Helmsley, especially after she died, I wasn't thinking of her as some bitch. You associate her with money. Ah, okay. Lavish Expenditure All right. is what she's known for after death. But she was called the queen of mean. Yeah. 
You see what I'm saying? She wasn't, mm -hmm. she was also called the queen of luxury or queen of luxury hotels, which makes perfectly sense, perfect sense. But she was called the queen of mean. That's a reputation. Okay. Well, let's say it is Mars. And you're saying, you know, people with Mars in, in Libra who are, you know, not mm, abusive. <laughs> My best friend has Scorpio rising with Mars and Libra. <laughs> okay. Let's just take a Excuse quick me. gander though. I mean, don't you kind of see it though as like Mars, an aggressor in real estate was more of her abuse towards women? I don't know, guessing. Maybe, like, I, mean, cer I mean, certainly, I mean, that's, this is the question, right? This is the, this is the question we're trying to figure out. In this particular case, I mean, my friend's Mars is in the 12th, is in the 12th. So it, so Mars can't be a warrior. Or it's right? like all that shit's directed like inwards. It's like all the aggression is towards self-destruction. But, but in his case, not necessarily. I mean, he's a musician. There's Libra. Yeah. And he's Nelly. And he's Nelly as fuck. He's, he's girly as fuck. So he's not Mr. Macho at all. Well, so maybe there's... that's, yeah. The opposition of Mars in Libra, I think, is interesting. Opposition is kind of the wrong word, but you know what I mean? Like Mars, mm -hmm. but in a Venus ruled sign. There's like no, a sort of a subverting expectation. Although what was interesting about him is it, he, I also have another good friend who had Mars and Libra and um, bo both of them very, uh, uh, very good at, at um, very diplomatic, very good at dealing with people in a diplomatic way, um, knowing the right thing to say, the right thing to wear when, you know, even if they're not into clothes, knowing what to wear when, that kind of Libra thing. Um, so, so like in execution, in execution, it's, and, and my best friend is one of the best interior decorators I've ever met. Right. So there's all this execution of aesthetic, right. And in this particular case, there could be certainly an execution of aesthetic happening. <clears throat> Note that the Mars is trining the part of fortune and the moon is on the part of fortune. Someone mentioned the moon I saw earlier, but the moon is on the part of fortune as well. But I mean, we don't need to spend too much time with this particular chart. But like I said, I wanted to test this thing about the ninth house being your reputation. And uh, we have a chart with somebody who had a very specific reputation. Yes, they had a reputation for being wealthy, and that is reflected in the in the Jupiter. But they also have this reflected for being a, this um, for being a, an abuser. This reputation for being an abuser. Right. So that's another thing to kind of be taking into account, but just something to something to look at here. I just thought that was interesting. What I thought yeah, I would cut something. Yeah, something. Yes, of course. Um, Do you need to put the chart back? Uh, on? Forgive me because really I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I have no idea. But the, the ninth is, is the 12th from the 10th. So yes. in this case, they have, they have both the same ruler. Uh, but uh, the, the execution, the praxis of, of, of our belief system would not necessarily correspond to our, uh, to, um, I mean, to what uh, should be the praxis. I mean, uh, it, it, would, it would, wouldn't be not normally if, if, if the nines and the tens had different rulers be necessary to, to see. Um, so, so what the belief is hidden, whatever 12th house kind and, and, and the execution, the, the, the practical um, execution of, of what it mean that your shown. System brings about your death. If it's the 12th, it's your undoing. Um, well, the well, 12th is an undoing. It can be, well, yeah, it is it's self undoing. It's an undoing, but, but here's the thing. It's an undoing of the person who is the 10th, who's your mother. So, it can also be the undoing. It can be the undoing of your profession, because think about it this way: what do, what do most gurus tell you to do, or what did Jesus say? Get rid of your possessions and follow me, right? So get rid of your your career, get rid of all the stuff that's important to you in the world, and come and be in the ninth house with me. You're dangerously so getting close to equating twelfth with religion, but okay, keep going. <laughs> Well, remember the twelfth is moksha in in Vedic astrology. It's re, it's not religion. It's it's renunciation. It's the it's the yeah. it's the renunciation of the cycle of birth and death. It's the going beyond. It's basically it's the release from that. So it's the moksha of so the twelfth would be the moksha of everything. 
But in order for there to be moksha, you have to renounce, you have to, there's a dissolution of all that has been built. And I think that's where Esther was coming in with this. Well, she was coming in with the idea of the ninth, this connection between the ninth and the tenth and belief and belief in forming action. But, Interesting. Sorry I interrupted you, Esther. Uh, yeah, Esther, did you have more to say around that? Understand. Sorry, I did not understand what you were asking. I said, did you have more to say? No, no, thank you. Hmm. <laughs> um, so um, so I want to make I just want to be sure that I'm making the distinction of that that when I'm talking about proxis, I'm talking about the tenth house as proxis and the ninth house as belief. And so, but once again, we've got Banati saying, hey, the ninth house is your reputation. Now, certainly on one level, this chart does reflect the idea of the ninth house as representing her reputation. She was known for wealth. She was known for being surrounded by splendor. The, the Leo and the sun represent gold. Right. So and she was known for being completely materialistic. We would also now know that the belief system would be based on that. What this person worships is is material acquisition. Right. The rule of the knife is in the second. This person's religion is money. This person's religion is is acquisition. And we see the sun, who is the natural significator for religion, with Venus. He's the ruler of the second. Once again, this person's religion is acquisition, substance, substantiation. And the Casimir Venus gives this person the ability to do so. <clears throat> so I thought I would come to a few other charts of holy people. Um, and um, I don't know why I got Bertie Madoff in there, um, but uh, holy, I've, I've got popes, and I've got um, I've got uh, two different. I don't think I got Vivekananda in time. Maybe I did. Oh, I think I did. Okay. This is Sri Ramana Maharshi. So some of you may know that when I go to India, um, every time I go to India, I go to a place called Tiruvannamalai. Tiruvannamalai is in um, the uh, southern state of Tamil Nadu, and it, it is um, it's a it's a, one of the whole it's a holy city, <laughs> or a holy place rather, because it has the largest Shiva complex in the world. The largest kind of working Shiva complex in the world is at the Anamalayar Temple or the Arun Arunachaleshwar Temple. So Arunachala is the name of this mountain that overlooks the temple, and it is considered um, a Shiva Lingam. It is considered an, an expression of Shiva itself. So the mountain itself is considered to be holy, holy Arunachala. And then there's this amazing temple there, one of the, one of the best examples of, of temple architect, of Southern temple architecture, what they call Dravidian, but which really would be Tamil. Um, it could be like Chola, Chola uh, period um, architecture. <clears throat> one of the best amazing amazing temple Antoine, and when you get a sec can you write the name in the chat i want to look at this place if you don't mind sorry for the interruption sure 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 yeah uh, and there's a very and, and so it's this particular place in italy i mean in italy <laughs> um in india is one of the few places and rather in tamil nadu Arunachala, um, Arunachala Mountain. It's one of the few places where foreigners visit. Like Tamil Nadu is not really a very visited state for foreigners. <clears throat> the north tends to be the most visited. You know, you get Rishikesh, you, the, the, the Himalayas, Varanasi is um, often really, uh, and, and you know, certainly when people visit, they go to Rajasthan, they go to Accra, you know, they do all, you know, Taj Mahal and all that stuff. But um, people don't really go to Tamil Nadu um, but Tamil Nadu is really the seat of low of the of, of southern Indian Hinduism. Like the true, in my opinion, the true Hinduism Hinduism is southern Hinduism, and Tamil Nadu 
Tamil Nadu is the seat of it. Tamil Nadu is the state. And then it's Arunachaleshwar Temple. Okay, so all that stuff's in the chat now. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, there are four, there are four um, places that are supposed to, four Shiva stanams that are supposed to give moksha in different ways. So um, what is it to, to be born Varanasi or Kashi, to die, no, no, to die Kashi, to be born this place called um, Tiagaraja or um, this is a place called Tiagaraja in Tamil Nadu, to hear Arunachala, to see Chidambaram Nat Nataraj. Now, everybody knows the Nataraj, that's the, the Shiva that it, um, is dancing and it's got the leg up, et cetera. And so that's, that, that particular version of Shiva, Nataraja, the king of the dance, comes from Chidambaram temple in Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu is really the seat of Hinduism, in my opinion, of in India, that's my opinion. And, um, and Tiruvannamalai is a very holy place, especially for Arunachala. And Ramana Maharshi became this, um, is a saint that's connected to this place. And his ashram is pretty much one of the only places there are only maybe two or three places in Tamil Nadu where foreigners generally go all the time and his ashram in Tiruvannamalai is a place that foreigners consistently go Arunachala Tiruvannamalai special special place Arunachala an amazing special vibration and um and that particular temple is where Lord Shiva is worshipped as fire and it's one of the Panchabhuta. Panchabhuta means five elements. It's one of the temples. There are five temples where Shiva is worshipped as a different element. And so this is where Shiva is worshipped as fire. So Ramana Ramaharshi starts it, meditating in like a basement part of the temple complex. He, he goes in meditation so deep and for so long that when people find him, the rats have been biting him and the, the insects and the rats have been have been feeding on him. And so there was this other um, this other Swami named um, Sashadri. His ashram is right next to Ramana Maharshi's ashram. And so Sashadri took Ramana Maharshi under his wing. And soon people started coming to him um, and uh, you know, coming to to him, and you know, I don't want to say worshiping, but becoming his followers. And he started his ashram there, as you can see. He died in the fifties. I think he died in fifty five or fifty six. So, how do we know that this person is a holy person, or is a person who is consumed with the need for God? <laughs> First of all, what's going on with the ninth house, and who is the ruler of the ninth? All that stuff. Uh, the ruler of the ninth is Mercury in Sagittarius. Mercury in Sag. Okay, and um, the and so for those who don't know the triplicity, so air is on the air is on the um, cusp of the ninth, which means the triplicity, and it's nighttime. So it means the triplicity rulers are Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter. So the first triplicity ruler, which re would represent the travel is Mercury. The second triplicity ruler, which would represent the faith, is Saturn. What's going on with him? Not in a great place. But in on the fortune. Isn't that interesting? But on the fortune, yeah. Wh and in which, the sixth. Okay, which puts Mercury where from the fortune? Huh? Oh, it's forming a triangle. Yeah, but what, what house from the fortune would Nine. it be? Nine. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. And is there any connection between the ascendant and the and the the ninth house or anything like that? Ascendant and the ninth house. Um, I don't see anything happening between Mercury and Venus. Well. Oh wait 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 the moon and Venus. The moon and Venus. Yes. And but I'm also thinking of something else. I'm being a little tricky. Libra uh, has more than one ruler. Hmm. Who's the other ruler of Libra? You mean by exaltation? Saturn. Saturn. Now, connect. We need. There needs to be some kind of connection, 
Either now, and here's the other thing with Jupiter. Note that the ruler of the ninth from the part of fortune is is in is in his own sign in Pisces. <coughs> Note, as you mentioned, that the moon is in its own sign and applying to the ruler of the ruler of the the of the ascendant. So that connects the ruler of the tenth and the ruler of the ninth. Now. What would we know about the tenth? What would we what would we learn about the tenth? Or what can we? I mean, Moon is a Cancer, but who's the other ruler for of Cancer? Jupiter. Jupiter is the other ruler of Cancer. Now, if we were to be looking at the three triplicity of rulers of Cancer, they are Mars, Venus, and the Moon. So. Anything connecting any of those with the with the knife? Because now here's the thing: this person's action is is all about godliness. Is there a way of knowing this in this chart? I see Mars and Venus more connected to each other than to the Moon. So who's who's applying to whom here? Let's get that out of the way. Sun is applying to Jupiter. Now, Sun, remember, Sun is, is religion and God, and Sun is applying to Jupiter. Now, here we've got, if we were to look at this from a moksha standpoint, we've got the ruler of the 12th from the part of fortune in its own sign. Um, and also, Mercury would rule the ninth in the 12th. Now, if we're, if we're thinking of from a Jyotish moksha standpoint. But to be honest with you, this chart doesn't say saint to me at all. I mean, necessarily, but maybe we don't know what to be looking for. Mars, Neptune. I remember somebody talking about Mars, Neptune and with, with things of that nature. We have the Mars, Neptune. But what we would really be looking for is this would be a, this is a guru's chart. Right. And guru is another word for Jupiter. In Sanskrit. What do you make of K2 being on the moon there? K2 with the moon. Ah, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. I just That's feel like I associate like religious, like religious leaders. They're supposed to be sensitive, but they're like supposed to move away from just like being ruled by their feelings, right? They're supposed to be like a sort of greater like guiding principle. I, I think you nailed it, sweetie. Because really? remember, K K2 is the moksha karaka. Okay. K2 is the moksha karaka and he's with the ruler of the 10th. What did I say? This person's action needed to be steeped in, this person's action was steeped in God. It was steeped in moksha, steeped in renunciation. So there it is. So we're looking for the ninth. We're looking at all this for this ninth house stuff, but it's really, it really, it's showing up with the 10th house. Also moving away from caring about career and reputation. Yes. This person's reputation what he's known for is who are you he's that's what he's known for who are you asking people that, that's kind of the, the basis of his philosophy who are you how can we see that <laughs> i wanted to also move, i wanted to ask about what you thought about sun in the third opposites opposite to its joy um, so maybe <clears throat> it's idea, and also it's in Capricorn too, right? So maybe it's idea of religion was not particularly, right? It's the opposite to its joy, so it wouldn't be formalized. It could obviously indicate, a, a, you know, a, a, an older brother or an important brother. And it could also mean, represent the father of being in jail in the third, you know, fourth and the twelfth, twelfth and the fourth, rather. Although it would be more likely if the Saturn were there. Note how, um, oh, no. Oh, so here's, you know, note how you noted that the Saturn was in Aries and that that wasn't good. But note also that the sun is applying to the Saturn by square, but with reception, with mixed reception. The sun is pushing nature at Saturn, and then Saturn is giving its exaltation to the sun. Mm, yeah. I didn't necessarily mean it as like a not successful thing. I just think it's interesting that it's Mars's sign and Mars's house. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. What does that mean? He's gonna have to yeah. work. It, it signals like a ton of like grunt work, but I don't Although, know this guy. Or work into, well, remember he's the one that, well, grunt work going in inside, right? This is the person that meditated for so long that rats were biting, were eating him. Oh Christ, okay. Yep, that kind of work. <laughs> exactly. And, and Aries rules the head. And was rats are small animals. Animals. Sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, go ahead. So, no, sorry, I, go ahead. It was my fault. But he was not present. It was also about his ego. I thought maybe the sun and the third in opposition to the ninth house. Uh, I mean, what he was preaching was that the that we are not we are not our ego. We are right. we are the divine. So uh, this this Mars Neptune is for, it's in the sevens for me. It's like not not being present. I mean, he was not present. His ego. I mean, as a person, he he. he most of the time, he was just uh, in, in, a, in a higher state, right? Yes. And all the <laughs> doctrine was about the ego. I mean, that everything is illusion and, and we are... Or, or, self, or self-identification. We're witnessing ourselves. Uh, yeah, yeah, identif- yeah, identifying ourselves with our body, identifying the self with the mind, etc. <clears throat> and of course, that would make sense with the moon K2, right? Because the, because the moon is the mind and K2 is where we renounce. Because remember, K2 is headless. Right, so it's the head. It's where he would tell you to chop it off. He would tell you to chop off the head, there. And so the, this this person's um, this this person's uh, proxis is really about um, putting putting this K two into proxis. Right. Remember, the moon is is whoever she comes into contact with. She comes into contact in this case with the ruler of the ascendant, and she's also with K two. So she's really working primarily to make make the, the the proxis is to renounce and is and to not identify it's the the moon has all of the power in this chart in my opinion right and so the sun of course is i mean we we put the sun for ego but really for for self and rational rational mind it's really mercury and the ruler of the ascendant right so and and then also the sun so the moon would be the opposite of that it would be our subconscious mind it would be our feelings and our our reflexes it's supposed to be her like his id isn't it kind of but, but it would be but it's also where the thoughts come from right remember yeah. we just learned that the sun the sun is the soul and the and the moon is the mind the moon is the thoughts the i moon thought moon thought. mind was more jyotish but that's cool Moon and mind, moon is mind and Jyotish. Moon is mind. No, I mean, I thought exclusively in Vedic astrology, not in traditional. Uh, um, and the ruler of the fourth. Yes, which okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, uh, so, yeah. So the moon and the ruler of the fourth of the mind. It, it, obviously, in our tradition, we're using the moon as the non-rational mind and Mercury as the rational mind, right? And then we can use, and then we can also use the ruler of the first to represent the mind, right? Because and the because first. The, yeah. The yeah. And moon in traditional too, though, like Western, hmm. it's like how everything comes to pass. It's like what reflects the light of the sun to everything. Right. Or the or the light of whatever to everything else. Exactly. So it's like it's the circumstances under which things happen. Yes. It, it and just, so for and, this yeah. guy, powerful. Yes, and. Yes, yeah. and. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and so yeah, so this person, so this, so it's kind of a, it's it's almost like a water walking kind of thing here, and this is the person, this is the person who there there was a gathering. He was he was preaching, and a monkey kept trying to. Um, uh, Esther might know this story. There was a monkey that kept bothering people, and they kept shooing the monkey away, and so finally he said, "Stop! Don't no." He goes, "Don't don't don't make it come away." He and he brought the monkey to it, and so this guy could talk to he could talk to animals, and so he the so he talked to the monkey. The monkey you know did all this chattering at him, and he and then the monkey leaves, and he said he goes he goes wait there's he, the monkey is going to bring a surprise, and the monkey brought the, its new children. It had just had babies. And so the monkey brought the children for for a Ramana Maharshi to bless. Wow. This is a true ass story. This is a really special person. <clears throat> and so, you know, this is like a God in human flesh kind of person. And so just interesting to have, yes, 
It's very interesting to have these kind. I wish that I had my own guru's chart because he was another one. Um, God and human flesh to all the way. But we've got another That's one. So Rama, isn't it Ramakrishna? We've got another one. Garth, did you already talk about this Venus Mars opposition where they're sort of both in detriment but pushing nature at each other? So maybe that's where the who are, who are you thing is. Yeah. And this might right? be a little reductive, but like I but think it's the, the first and the Mars seventh. is like but it's yeah. the first and the seventh. So who are you? Here I am, there you are, who are you? Right. So I think yeah. that might. I think that might be where this Mars, the Mars Neptune that um, that Esther brought up, it's this in this oppositional kind of um, system. Really, it's a Venus Pluto, right? She's finished with Mars. She's way finished with him. Yeah, she's way finished with him. And it's approaching because Pluto's retrograde. Yep. So that it's really that, which is on some level makes it even more important. Because then Pluto is what we renovate. When we look in there, we go, no, we no, uh, redo that completely. Redo, and it's Venus in detriment. And Venus is like appetitive, right? So this guy's going to renounce like sex renounce and it. like all the yes. alcohol and food and things, and, whatever. Right, and it's in a and sign. And is. And yeah. it's in a sign of the, of the organs that evacuate. Yep, yep. So we don't have, so it's the opposite of, of Venus and Taurus where she would enjoy being a girl. It would be the opposite. You know, don't don't surround me with jewels and or diamonds are our girls, best friends. That That's Venus and Taurus, right? It'd be the opposite of that. Yeah, good, good point. Interesting points with that. I mean, it's in, in Jyotish, we've got different cr criterion for figuring out why something, why a saint is a saint, right? And of course, in Jyotish, it's baked into the system. <clears throat> but here we don't have that. And isn't it interesting that it wasn't necessarily the ninth house that pointed to it? Even though this person is a ninth house figure, it's a guru. <clears throat> Okay, so here's Ramakrishna. Now, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa met my met my guru. Um, in well, my guru is in is dead. So, but I I still kind of prayed him, etc. But he met my guru, and they and they had a full conversation without talking. And so, this is one of the great Kali worshippers, Ramakrishna. As a matter of fact, there's a a place in Calcutta called Dakshineshwar Temple, which is which is where his uh, samadhi is because he was a worshiper of the goddess so let's see if we can see a goddess worship in here if that would be third house right that would be sects that would be sects that aren't ninth or we would be looking for some connection with the goddess in the ninth house or some connection with the goddess in third because remember the ninth house is really the more structured sense of of like like christianity like like paternalistic religion and the third house being goddess represented sex and pagan pagan sex etc so maybe we should all, all this time have been looking at the third house for ramakrishna and Ra and ramana maharshi and notice that the, the sun was in the third in that chart instead of the ninth house being involved well i mean interesting to see either way note that we have saturn and cat and cap oh note that we have the ruler of the ninth and the ruler of the first in, in mutual reception Now, is there anything important with Venus or the moon? So ruler of the ninth is in the 12th in and Venus is in that sign. Uh, ruler of the 12th is in Scorpio. No, sorry. Ruler of the, excuse me, Mars. In the 12th. Mm-hmm. On Venus. the part of fortune. Yeah. Venus is in Aries. Mars is sign. Got it. Got it. Got it. That's the connection. Sorry, I Venus. said it really weirdly. <laughs> got it. Got it. But I would be more looking for Mars to be in Venus's sign. Now it is nighttime, 
So it means that the religion, that the person, the, the, the planet that represents the religion is Venus, mm. right? The, the planet that represents the, the travels is Mars. The planet that represents the religion is Venus. So there it is. There's, the, there's Kali there. And notice that it's Kali, it's, it's Venus and Aries. So yeah. she's not in a, she's, she's in a, a warrior sign. Kali is, is fierce. I've never looked at these charts from a modern, from a, a Western perspective before. I've only ever looked at them from a Jyotish perspective. I didn't really think it worked. But note that we've got we've got the ruler of the ninth on the part of fortune. Mm. Was Saturn the ruler? No, it was Mercury was the ruler of the ninth in the last one. You and also Saturn in a Mars sign too. Yeah, there's mutual reception. And, yeah, and you said, formed a grand trine between this sort of exalted Jupiter and Mercury in a Jupiter sign again. Mm -hmm. Actually, we can include the moon because the moon's gonna try. Oh no, the moon's done. She's translated, she's finished. Okay, mm -hmm. but she's finished with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But still, it's like, I don't know, a lot of, I do get a lot of guru too. What do we have with the Saturn, Jupiter? Well, with Saturn, Saturn is austerity. Mm -hmm. And then Mercury and Jupiter look at, so it's all water signs, so it can go beyond language, right? Those are all mute. Those signs are all mute. So Mercury is retrograde and mute. This person probably didn't like to talk or probably when they got into their deepest spiritual, it was beyond speech. And what did I say? When he met, when he met my guru, they had a conversation without speaking. How do you know they had a conversation then? Like afterwards, there was just an understanding. Oh, there was a there's a there's a famous um. So the, when Rama when Ramakrishna met um Trilanga Swami in Varanasi, it was a huge thing, and so all of the disciples of of Trilanga Swami in Varanasi wrote about it. Ah, <laughs> and so later, and so later when he was talking, he told them about the conversation that they had. Oh my god, that's nuts. Yeah, because, you know, look, Ramakrishna was born in 1836. Trilanga Swami died in 1887. So, you know, they're all, they're, you know, they're, they're I mean, and, and he died and supposedly died at 280. Anyway, but um, that's beside the point. Okay, so you say you do think that there's there's something, this this Mars, this ninth house, first house thing is important, obviously. Note the proxis. Note the proxies, Jupiter in what sign? Cancer. Cancer. We've got another 10th house ruler in Cancer. And look at how close the K2 is to the 10th house ruler again, to the 10th house cusp again. Interesting. And of course, Scorpio would be the natural 10th house. Right, which would make Venus the natural ninth, which makes even more sense. But if this makes sense too, because you've got Mars and the you've got so this makes sense too. Very interesting chart. All right, so we're moving away from so we're moving away from the saints. And we're going to the sinners who pretended to be saints. So we're going to look at, let's look at John Paul II. No, he was a sinner. He was always so cute. He was Even cute. <laughs> He's called the patron saint of, pe of pedophiles. Oh, um, right. Okay. Well, yeah. not because he was one, but but hey, remember when we looked at Maciel, Maciel? Yeah, Maciel, were they friends? They were they Maciel, did. Maciel sponsored the Pope's trips to Mexico. Oh, he was. Remember, Maciel, Maciel is the greatest fundraiser in the history of the Church, of the modern Church. And so, of course, he was at the right hand of Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II shielded many, many pedophiles. And mind you, remember, it's not until he dies 
that they, it's not until 2000 and what, 2002 or whatever, when he dies and Benedict the 16 takes over that they start finally addressing some of these things. These things were known going, some of these things were known, Maciel, that was known going all the way back to the 50s, to the 40s and 50s when what, John the 23rd was still Pope. You know, so anyway, so here we've got, now we've looked at this already. When, when did we look at it? We looked at it for sun, if I'm not mistaken, when we looked at sun, because we looked at that for, notice that the sun is the ruler of the 10th. <coughs> We're looking for the ninth house <coughs> ruler. Note that the moon is the ruler of the ninth. <coughs> it's in the eighth, and the moon is applying to the square of Saturn. And one of the things about Pope John Paul II was he was extremely um, doctrinaire. And as, as a matter of fact, he is single-handedly responsible for rolling back all of the advances made during Vatican II. So he's essentially the anti-Vatican II Pope. He's the reactionary Pope to everything that's been ha that's happened with Vatican II. So immediately when he comes in, he starts to, uh, oh, so for instance, I'm here in Latin America. There was an archbishop by the name of Oscar Romero. And um, Oscar Romero was put in, uh, was installed originally to put down the Sandinistas, you know, to put down the, you know, the, he was in, uh, he was in um, Costa, not Costa Rica, he was in uh, El Salvador. And so remember, there was all this problem going on in El Salvador. And so finally, I'll, he starts to see what's really happening and wants to be of help. We're talking about Romero. And he goes to the Pope for help and the Pope won't see him. And he goes back to El Salvador and is murdered, is assassinated. And so this is the kind of Pope because, and it was because he was uh, he was doing something called liberation theology, which was created, it was basically a theology for the poor to help them out of their situation. Um, but it gave too much hope to the poor. It was considered kind of too socialistic or communistic and not hierarchical enough, and it was considered her her heretical. And so JP II got rid of all of the liberation theology. Like he got rid of all of the, any of it. They they went into all of the, the seminaries and they they weeded out anybody that, that reeked of any kind of liberal kind of theology. And they kind of reinforced this medievalist, this kind of medievalist standpoint or um, viewpoint. And the reason that it's important that you believed that he was a really good person because he is the first PR Pope. He is the first Pope to become an international celebrity. And the, it was used as a camouflage for how he was really fucking destroying the Roman Catholic Church. Basically, almost all of the people that we know who aren't Catholic, you know, over 40, over 40, they left while he was Pope. So, so just keep, remember he was Pope from 1979 to 2002. That's almost my, that's my entire adulthood. My, almost most of my adulthood. So long, long lasting Pope. So ninth house, what we can see here is the nature of the belief. And the Pluto here, so the need for absolute control and power <clears throat> and pulling the strings. Second triplicity ruler of the of the second house, it's daytime, so that would be Mars. Look at how Mars is within five degrees of the ascendant. This person's faith is on display. We can't say that this person's faith was um, insincere at all. Hard time explaining this, but I find it interesting that this is a new moon and Mercury moving into combustion. Sun and its joy. Well, think about think about what the moon does or the parts of the body that the moon represents. The moon is the tit that gives the milk and the stomach that receives it. So it, we've got, we remember we were just talking about this moon in Gemini, how it's 12 houses away from, or 12 signs away from its own sign. So it can't be fecund and have a tit full of milk. It's burned out. So basically the, what do they call it? The skin is dry. But it's still combust. I'm still considering it combust. We've talked about this. I don't necessarily consider it a conjunction, but I do consider yeah. it combustion. 
you're a worst of both worlds kind of guy. I love it. Mm-hmm. But so um, the moon is still yeah. combust. Combust. And the moon, as you said the Mercury moving into it, the combustion too. And so also, this could be blinded. You know, this person's blinded by their faith, blinded by their unswerving faith. Right? Sun is in Taurus, fixed. Jupiter in school in Leo, Leo on the ascent on the midheaven. It's fixed. Moon and Saturn. Saturn is fixed. So even though it's mutable signs, this yeah. person's intellectual. So this person's got an intellectual dexterity, but it's all at the service of conservatism. Neptune's right there too. You want to talk like deluded Neptune. by stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So deluded by one's own goodness. Yeah. And this also could be, wait, this also could be the PR Pope. This could be the PR that he was really such a good person, that he was really such yeah. a good Egyptian. Right? Well, it's this both, is what isn't we... it? Yeah. It's the lies we tell ourselves and the lies we get other people to believe. Although these lies are public. 10th house is yeah. public. So it's the 10, lies 000... that we get others to believe. So it's the yeah. lies we get others to believe. So it's the lies about ourselves we get others yeah. to believe. So it's the lies that others choose to believe about us. Right, coming yep. back to reputation, coming back to reputation. So we can see both the ninth house and the tenth house. The ninth house conservatism and 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 control freakiness, and the tenth house. Oh, look what a sweet young, what a sweet nice uh, you know little priest he is, or what a sweet nice little pontiff. Esther's saying too, all this preponderance of planets in the seventh house is sort of like people pleasing like it's it's related to dealing with others it's, but it's exactly the opposite not a people pleaser at all if anything more the reputation order 10th and 9th for hiding pedophiles combustion mm, interesting um if anything just the opposite uh, except for you know the, except for his except for the, his advisors his trusted advisors no no concern at all for others yeah, I don't know if it's concern for others or so much as that is the domain in which he plays is other people. He's not oh, doing shit for himself. It. Right? Got it. Be got anything got without it. his his followers. He needs a like a flock of people to, you know, trick. Although the ruler of the ascendant is in its own is in its own sign. It's strong. And with K2, yeah, look, but with K2, K2. yeah. So it's in its own sign. So it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's of, it's ultimately of the eighth house. What would be of the eighth house, which would be the dark mystery of death and what's, what's beyond death, right? If we were looking at it from a, from a whole sign perspective, it's in the seventh, sure enough, um, from this perspective, but, but it's, but usually planets in the seventh, the ascendant ruler in the seventh from its own sign, I mean, it, from its own house is in the opposite of its own sign and detrimented. That's not the case here. So even more an example that this person could maybe based on their own belief system or their own idea of what would bring redemption could abuse others or could, or, or, or their focus on others, there would, they would be the power in the situation anyway. Note that the Mars- Rahu the, in the first two. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to say, note that the, the, Ruler of the seventh is is in the detriment and retrograde. So the other is weak and yep. in their clutches. And he's moving away from <clears throat> like K2 seventh, but that means Rahu's in the first. Rahu's in the first, but what do they call Rahu? The agent of ambition. Exactly. No, I mean it almost as I mean I actually have this, so I don't want to get too spouty on how it's not a good thing, but like I don't know, like extreme narcissism, that the kind sure. that allows you to sit idly by while people are abused. Messianism. Messianism. That's also the Jupiter Neptune up there. This guy had a messiah complex. Messianism. This 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 guy tried to reinstate the medieval papacy practically. I mean, he knew he couldn't, but theologically, he tried to. He, like I said, he rolled back almost every single advance that was created by the Whoa. Vatican II. And, that, and Vatican II ended in 1968. He Wait, became Pope in 79. 
how oh, many sorry. people are we talking like indulgences one oh and no, two. no 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 <laughs> no 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 like no, 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 no. right. that's 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 that will never come back well i mean that certainly has i mean when we think about Maciel Maciel, that's an indulgence. He looked the he's, other way while well, he raised 70, 80. Else. Right. Yeah. And because he was the, the best fundraiser, he, I mean, fundraising is an indulgence that pays for your sins. So not, so I'll say not formally, <laughs> but, okay. but certainly. <laughs> and Antoine, can we see his conservatism, this thing that you just described that he did? Is that visible from the chart? The conservatism, the moon, the moon square, the moon square, Saturn. Okay, there it is. Okay. And yeah, they're the both moon, in Mercury signs. And right, so it's all about it's all about fighting her heresy. It's all about fighting new thinking. Right. It's all about controlling how we think about the religion and what we write. Right. Remember, he went after professors. He went after theologians. Mercury. He went after the teachers and the, the professors and the theologians, the people that are teaching us how to think about our religion. So something to think. There's about. another grand trine in this chart, too. Oh, but it's only with never mind. It's with Rahu. And Pluto, never, never mind. I feel like we've been seeing a lot of big triangles today. We have, we've, and we've been seeing, this is the first time that we see that the ruler of the ascendant, now this isn't a saint's chart, although he was made a saint. He was just, he was just beatified, but this isn't, I mean, I would say he's not a saint, but um, this is not a saint's chart. This is not a holy man's chart, even though he is considered a holy man in Catholicism, but of course, I don't know, I've known very few. So we're going to move now to a Pope who absolutely not a holy man at all. Matter of fact, we're going to look at two Popes. If anything, this, this is the Pope who said when they were drawing, when they were creating a statue of him, they were creating a statue of him in the, in the, um, in the um, style of Paul. And, you know, usually you see Paul with a book. And so they were um, creating a, a statue of him in the style of Paul. And he said, he goes, don't put a book in my hand. He goes, don't, don't make a statue of me with a book in my hand. Put a sword in my hand. This, this, this Pope scandalized Europe by being at the head of his own armies and fighting in his own armies for territory. Was this against... guy like majorly into like indulgence too? Um, it, 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 it's during this period, but it's late, but it's a, it's no, a sorry. I don't mean indulgences like Catholic. I mean, like, did he eat and drink and F U C K like a oh, mother? What makes you, what, what makes you, yeah. What makes you say that? Um, whole sign 10th with all of that cancer Jupiter right there. Whole all the sign. planets. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And ruler and Jupiter ruling the fifth as well as that. Exactly. What you were yeah. <laughs> um, even if Saturn were ruling the fifth, it would all be there in Cancer with with Jupiter. Um, this guy was homosexual, from what I uh, what I remember hearing. Um, and more than this, this is one of the Renaissance popes, and the Renaissance popes are all known for excess. They're all known for excess. That was the word. Thank you. Okay. They're all great. known for excess of some some sort. They're all known of, for excess of some sort. Now, this, like I said, this particular pope, <clears throat> you had popes that were certainly known for excess, you know, for for um, draining the treasury, um, for draining the treasury for different things. Um, this pope drained the treasury for war, for um, in order to you know to in order to build up war resources. So okay. What so how can we see? So, first of all, what's the nature of this person's belief? So we look at that from the ninth house and from the second triplicity lord of the ninth. Wait, but Garth, we're going alcubicious, right? Because I feel like it switches if you do it's Either ninth, way. it's cancer can fourth sign. Is it do whatever you want? Do whatever you want. If you do you want oh, to I'm do saying, I'm, I'm just asking if it switches. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Go it ahead. does switch. It does switch, but yeah, do whichever way you want. If you prefer doing it, I mean, look at it. Let's look at it both ways. So the cusp, we'll look at the cusp first. So we got a, we got water on the cusp. So the second triplicity ruler is Mars. 
So what we know about that, and I like that, because what we know about that is that when Mars represents the faith, what does it mean? They don't believe shit. Oh, I thought you were going to say they believe in something like deviant. No, no, no. Mars is descent. Remember when we saw that for the ninth house, that Mars, yeah. is it represents yeah, descent. Yeah, but descent isn't always like, I'm going to pretend to be Pope and like do what I want. Descent could be like founding another religion because you don't agree with the one that's happening, right? In this particular case, if you founded another religion, you'd be you'd be burned at a stake. I guess that's a pretty darn oh, good That's point. excessive. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah once again uh, remember the ninth house is the only house where we had to update things mm. we had to update things you, you yeah nowadays you can do that in in 1445 you'd be burned at the stake in the, the 15th century is the is the birth of the spanish inquisition so the 1400s is when the spanish inquisition starts going around and killing people because they think they're still practicing jews or whatever. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely, he could not do that. What you generally had, see, this we're coming from a period of extreme patronage. We should be looking at the eleventh house. What well, we're we're coming from an ex, a period of patronage. Generally, what you would have in this period is well well to do families, uh, you know, uh, like the 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 top the the dynasties, the important dynasties would usually give if they had more than one son. One son would go to the church <clears throat> and another son would go to the military. <clears throat> you still see that <clears throat> here in Latin America, here in Mexico, you still see that in well-to-do families. One son goes to the church. One son is a military person. And so what would they would do is they would basically, in order to become a cardinal, you had to pay a lot of money basically to make your child a cardinal or make your nephew a cardinal or whatever. Um, and so actually... This person, Pope Julius II, his uncle was Pope. His uncle is, is his uncle is uh, Giuliano della Rovere, and he was Sixtus IV. The term nepotism comes from the relationship between Pope Julius II and his uncle, Pope Sixtus IV, because nepo, nepo, nepote is nephew. And so damn, Antoine. Damn. that's where we come from this idea of so this person is the essence of nepotism this is where the idea of nepotism comes from is from pope julius ii as the nephew of pope of juliana rovere um de la rovere would be, um, can we derive uncle in his chart who which house is it well you tell me Dang it. Would be the point. mother's brother. So mother is the 10th house and third from 10th is 12th. Mm -hmm. Two, okay. Three. Or it could be the father's brother. Oh, yeah. Of course, if it's the father's brother, then it's the sixth house. Or it could be re a relative. Who, what house would that be? Relative would be uh, the third house. There, there we go. So we have either the third house, the sixth house, or the 12th house. All so right. which one is it? Um, so it's either Saturn, Jupiter, or Mercury. They're all Bam. in the same <laughs> They're all there. sign. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Okay. <laughs> and they all end up being whole sign tenth. Who's known for it? Or the and, there, <laughs> and if we keep it, and if we keep it in the ninth, the ruler of the tenth is in the ninth. Damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so cool. based on okay so based on the moon based on the moon what kind of belief if we just use so we didn't use the mars but if we use the moon to represent the belief what would we mm -hmm. think okay so here is saturn room sign Wouldn't it be whatever what whatever my uncle says advantages me would be what they believe? Yeah, that's not what they believe. <laughs> Is it? I mean, think about it. Can, remember what we just saw? All of the planets that represent an uncle, a relative, and also the eleventh yeah. house, which would be the eleventh, which would be the you know the patronage. Wouldn't this person believe whatever the, their patron tells them to? Okay. 
or at least they would cause... show that they do. Hmm. I think this person would believe. I think what I think is that this person's belief is whatever will get them to the top. Yes, that I see. There was, he was supposed to become Pope when uh, the Borgia Pope became Pope. He's, he follows the Borgia Pope. See, because Saturn is with Mercury and Jupiter and the sun. The ruler of the 11th, the ruler of the 10th. Okay, right? so the ruler, ruler of the, of the Ascendant is with Mars and part of Fortune. But other than that, I don't see like a major bellicose vibe to this guy. Can you explain that a little bit? I mean, that's what, that's plenty. Isn't that so that's plenty? plenty? Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I feel like I was like looking for something and I wasn't finding it. Okay, I guess that's well. Funny. And also, if we use Mercury as the ruler, of, uh, as the other ruler of the ascendant, he's with Pluto and Saturn and Sun. Even though he's closest to the to Jupiter, but he's with these other three malefic planets too. Mm, okay, this guy was irascible and difficult. And look, and Mer and Moon and Aquarius, not you know Moon and Aquarius. We've been seeing this with Moon and Aquarius. Not easy to get along with. Well, yeah, it's like the most misanthropic sign, but also yeah, the well, most humanitarian. Right, exactly. So it's it's the most um, it's the most easily impatient if you're not if your thinking isn't what it thinks it should be. It doesn't really care about alien. Oh, it, it's a sign. Uh, remembering that Saturn is the author of solitariness. A Aquarius is always about alienation. Always about some form of alienation. That's why when you see people, that's why when when you see people saying, "I I've always had unrequited love and things of that," Venus is an Aquarius. And can because this be said generally? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, can this be said generally that um, whatever house Aquarius rules, you can feel alienated in that part of your life? great <laughs> i mean you know i hate to say shit like that but i'll see why not no, but, yeah. like, but like if this is something some major planet is involved there like uh we we just mentioned that for moon and aquarius uh that could bring feelings of alienation so but, would that but, wouldn't that be like I, I mean of course it would depend on the entire chart but the broader theme could be this right I think so. I think the theme of Aquarius is alienation. One of the themes of Aquarius is alienation. And I have wow. Venus and Aquarius and have definitely felt alienated from um, love re and romantic relationships. Um, I have Mars modern and, vibe, but I, I have it. Mars and Aquarius and, and have, you know, and have taken actions that uh, alienate others and myself. Um, yeah, so sure. Yeah, I, I think we could say yes. And a love that. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. I have I a lot. I probably have more aqua in my chart than anyone here, and I I feel it. It's once again, it's not, and it's not done on purpose. You know, it's not, it's not like they're trying. It's it, it's no, not like they're trying to be malicious. Leo, it's it's literally detriment. Like you're you you're presenting contrary to what is considered normal. Yeah, and and not only is it considered normal, but you don't consider it normal. That's the other, I mean, that's for me with all my stuff in Aquarius, it's like, I've never wanted to conform. And it's the, it's the necessity. It's the, it's people, you know, I've had friends in my life that have said, oh, hey, don't you want to be loved? And I say, wait, 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 you're not asking me if I want to be, I have plenty of love. You're asking me, don't I want to be approved of? And of that, I couldn't give a shit. That is the essence of Aquarius. Oh, then I'm, I'm so write that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you should start some merch. Antoine what was wait what was the so wait wait what what wait, wait i'm always looking for shit to put on t-shirts what, what what was what was it i should have said <laughs> uh you said that you're not looking uh you, you have plenty of love but you're not looking to be approved right i'm not looking for approval most people when they ask you don't you want to be loved they're asking you don't you want approval and it's like no i don't give a fuck about approval i've got plenty of love <laughs> But most people want, most people, a lot of people mistake 
approval for love, right? I mean, of course, it's easy to, right? You go, you sing, and you, you get applause. That's love. Mercury conjunct Aquarius for me, Layla. <laughs> that's love. You know, the applause is love. Approval is love, and uh, uh, approval is a sign of love. Is a, is a, is, a, is an extension or a, an expression of love, but it's not love itself, right? Well, yeah, I guess you settle for what you can get, right? Like if you yeah. can have love, you're going to be approved of or, you know, TikTok. Right, famous. right. You're with, with love comes approval. I mean, ultimately what I was saying, well, a lot of people, mo many, many people um, st strategize how they live based on how other people will perceive them. And I think that that's something that Aquarius doesn't really often, depending on obviously what else is in the chart, <clears throat> that's not a preoccupation of Aquarius. <laughs> it, I mean, it wants it wants to make sure things are egalitarian and everybody is comfortable and happy and everybody is served in the same way. It's it's got the collective well being in mind, but it doesn't really care if you approve of its behavior or not. It's still Saturn. It's still a malefic planet sign. You don't have to approve. It can still leave a bad taste. Just like, you know, just like Mars rules the scorpion. And what did the scorpion say to the frog? Hell, well, you knew what I was. Damn, you just going to bust all over my tomb luminaries like that? It's cold, <laughs> Antoine. It's cold. He chose violence today. <laughs> Oh, I was I, thinking. I, I, I got an acupuncture. Yeah. I got an acupuncture session yesterday, so I'm 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 rewired. I'm, I'm rewired and ready to read everyone for filth. Wait, what were we gonna say? I will tell you though, Antoine, your analogy. You were talking earlier about the moon and sort of how it rules the tits and the stomach, and so it's like feeding and nourishment. And I was thinking in the back of my head, damn, moon being in fall in Scorpio because of the venom there makes a lot more sense. Mm. I mean, it always. Makes sense. But it's like I like the the visuals interesting. Yeah, and so the venom and the and so yeah, so one has to be careful that the venom doesn't come out in the mother's milk, right? Yep. Because there can be a, a little a little thread of venom that has to be watched. And so, like I said, when when it comes to the Scorpio and the Frog, he says, "Why did you sting me?" He goes, "Well, motherfucker, you knew what I was. That's what I do. I think it's similar." And so, I, chart ruler with Mars. I think that that's 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 plenty. Yeah, you know that's and the fact that they're both on the ruler of the ascendant. I mean, both on the part of fortune, which we use as an ascendant, right? And so I think that's plenty. And the fact that the Mar that the moon is applying to Mars next. If I'm not wrong, I think Hitler had this similar configuration where Libra is the ruler of his ascendant, and uh, it's also conjunct Mars in his eighth house. It, it is uh, Venus is Mars and Venus are in Taurus, and Venus is yeah. retrograding towards it. Yeah, Venus is retrograding exactly. to the square of Saturn. My mom has Moon in Scorpio, and I always joked that she breastfed for ten minutes. She had no interest. See, she had no interest in it. It will. I mean, remember the Moon rules mothers, motherhood. So it doesn't mean that you might not be a mother, but it it will mean that you're way of mothering may be different than what we it won't be betty crocker you know it won't be it won't be that kind of mother you know it might be a more tough love mother it could be a, a, a totally insufficient mother but moon and scorpio yes. can it can be difficult to find yes, the it nurture. Can be. <laughs> it can be difficult to find the ability to nurture it can be difficult to find the it can be difficult to you know children aren't rational and children can't control themselves and moon um i'm gonna ask you um specifically uh shanice when you were little and couldn't get yourself together emotionally how was your mother then because that's the most important because that's when the moon in scorpio would really show itself it wouldn't be able to handle it she'd either put it up short I i'll give you something to cry cry about that kind of shit or leave or something like that but i bet that's where especially you would see it Really? Hmm. She said, she said, <laughs> I guess Bullseye. I got four bullseyes. Yeah. I'll give you something to don't... cry about. That's what it, I, guess, I, I don't know. 
That's interesting. I've never been a mother where I could never see that happening. It's well, I mean, you you we might see it in in um siblings who don't have emotional regulation. Or um oh, or people yep, you're in relationship. My sister does say that to me, and I do have a moon in Scorpio. Okay, so that's it. So the, the thing is that if there's anything the moon the, the a moon in Scorpio can do, it's can regulate its emotions. It, it cannot. Can, it can. It can drip oh. them out. Oh no, can... I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible. Oh really? Yeah. But you know where my moon in Scorpio is? Where? It's the most visible point on my chart, other than the sun. Oh. It's like within a few minutes of the midheaven. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's really public. So it's got a, yep. so, and is, is it, is it void of course too? I guess technically it is. Yeah. Cause it's at oh. 29 degrees. What else would it hit? Well, what's at zero or one or two? Well, my son is at one degree Aquarius, but you don't believe in out of sign. Um, I was going to say conjunctions. I'm not, not the right word. Aspects. But it would. I yes, I do. That one I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. 29, well, it's going to hit. Yeah. It's going to hit the sun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I remember. I've said if if the planet is at the end of a sign and applying to another planet at the very beginning, I do take it into consideration. Okay. So, for instance, yours is at 29 Scorpio and your son is at zero Aquarius or something? One, one Aquarius, yeah. So, yeah. So then when it gets to one Sagittarius, it's applying to the sun. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean it's Thumbus, right? No, uh, no, it's sextile. Oh, sorry. Or square, I thought it was a conjunction. Or okay. square or something. Sex, no, sextile. Sextile. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought it was in the like the very next sign. Okay, okay. okay. No, if it were the very next sign, then it would definitely be combos. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's a sextile. Um, but and who's the ruler of the? Wait, what? What's your chart? What, wait, wait. What's your uh, chart ruler? No, Aquarius. So seventh house is Leo. Is that correct? Yepers. So yep. dealing so dealing with people. So these would come out emotionally. The emotional stuff would come out, especially when dealing with people. We're dealing, you know, the ruler is, this, is is the, the sun in the first. So you're saying it would. Oh, the sun's already and the sun's there too in the first, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's come back. Let's go back to the ninth house to our ninth house. To <laughs> you're like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, well, well, no, 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 okay. Moving right along. Moving right along. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> oh, oh god. god. You know, Anne Louise le left me a little. Um, I was gonna work on her chart today because she left me a little donation. So, but she didn't show up today, so too bad. Um, but uh, but but you got a little. You got got to switch in there. Um, okay. So here's the Borgia Pope Alexander the Sixth. I like to use his chart. And so what did this person believe? What was this person's beliefs? So rule of the ninth is Venus and then the second triplicity ruler, it's nighttime is um, Saturn. Yeah. I, I like how this triplicity ruler thing is working out. Based on the Saturn, on the what do we think? What do um, we think? Right on the, right on the ascendant. Yeah, and with the sun, what In do we dignity. think? Ah, combust combust in, in his own sign in an earth an earthy yeah but saturn corn. beats sun in this configuration but but think about it it's not about who wins it's about think about what we're talking about we're talking about a belief system yeah what, what does saturn and capricorn believe to me it believes in negation of things not in the K2, like dissolving sense, in the sort of like limitation. Its rule structure is that of limitation. I would not agree in this particular case. Wait, somebody just wrote something in. In this particular case, I'm going to say uh, closer, maintaining status, status quo. Closer, what is, what, what is Capricorn? What is, what is the sigil of Capricorn? What is it representing? A sea goat or something? It represents a mountain goat. Yeah. What does the mountain goat do? It never gives up till it gets to the top. It, it climbs. climbs. It oh, so climbs. You're saying it's ambitious, I guess. Yeah. It climbs. Yeah. Status. Status is one of the most important aspects of Capricorn. Consciousness of status. <laughs> Climbing. 
the the the, the status climber or the the ladder the 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 what do they call the social climber Capricorn. Yeah, I get it. Some materialism there too. Not just some. It's huh? it's a licentious sign. Capricorn is. A, we have to we have to kind of get we we have to get out of or not get out of but we have to kind of get into this idea of what they call the lust of the goat. Yeah. <laughs> I would just want to point out without bringing attention back to my chart that you are now yeah. talking about my chart ruler, its sign and its house placement, but I will now shut up. Okay, well very good. <laughs> oh, I, I want to speak to I want to speak to that for a second because I had somebody come in um, to our session on, uh, um, and she, I, <clears throat> and this happens often. <clears throat> you'll be talking, like especially, when you'll, you'll be talking about a chart, and somebody will say, "Oh, well, um, oh, I thought it was really interesting what you said about blah blah blah," because I have that too. And what I want to say to everybody around that is this: instead of thinking, "Wow, oh, I've got that. Listen hard, I've got that." What we really need to be thinking is, how is my this different from the one he's talking about? Because yeah, you've got Saturn and Capricorn, but do you have Saturn and Capricorn on the ascendant with the sun? Yours is different. And yeah, so that's how, that's how you have to be thinking about things. So because what, what, because what I, I ended up finding, what, ends up, what I ended up kind of finding people do is that they end up kind of judging your delineation on the chart, your your delineation of them on another chart. Yeah, which is dumb. It's like, such it's a like, human nature. Right, and it's like, no, 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 not, no, no, no. Yeah, you do have, yes, you do happen to have that, but I promise you yours looks different from the one I'm talking about. Don't worry, I'm not catastrophizing. I was just laughing because you've been reading me all, oh, no. all, all no, session. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I've been I've been wanting, I've been wanting to like say this because this is something because since Thursday, I've been because this woman said, Oh, you know, you were talking about Mars and Taurus, and I have Mars and Taurus too. And blah, and you know, and she just went off on this little tangent. It was like, sweetie, I promise you your Mars and Taurus doesn't look anything like this. And if it does, tell me. <laughs> if it does tell if me, it does tell me. <laughs> Right. If it does tell me, I'm, I'm that's no problem. But I promise you, it doesn't, which means that it's not acting the same way as what I just said. Even though it just happens to be in the same side. So I got. So I, you just you activated the soapbox without you being the necessary object of the soapbox. So there we go. Um, so my point about this is that ultimately Saturn and Capricorn is practical. Yes, agree. It's and all the other stuff too. Yeah, practical I mean. and interested in, in climbing and interested in status and in the status of its position. <clears throat> so this person, we have another opportunist here. Note that the Venus, now note that the Venus is on the cusp of the 12th. Yeah. This person's Wait, belief what? is, so oh, yeah, sorry, person, 3, 13, not 23. Yeah, right there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. this person's belief, they don't, they're not really sharing what they believe. Right? They don't really share what they're not going to share it. You don't oh, really know. He might have some love on the DL. That's how I read Venus in the book. Absolutely. Which I have. Also, fact, by the way. If anything, this person's belief is about love, is about love and pleasure. So now we're getting now, actually now we're kind of getting somewhere. Can we see, and of course we need to look at chart after chart after chart, including our own, can we see that the ninth house might be the reigning ethos by which we live? You're saying ruler of the ninth in the 12th, in this case, or in general. Okay. Because this guy was super libidinous. This guy, ruler this of the guy fifth is also in the 12th, just to sort of note that that's out. That's right. So, And so the ruler of the ninth is also the ruler of the the ruler of the, the natural fifth, the whole sign fifth. Well, so this would be the ruler of the 10th in this particular case, um, but <clears throat> ruler of the fifth is in the 12th as well. That's right. And did we also not discuss that, that uh, in some traditions, 12th house is quote unquote bed pleasures and Venus being there? Yes, that's right. Yeah. We sure did it in Jyotish. In Jyotish, it's the bed pleasures. That's absolutely right. It's sleep yeah. and bed pleasures. That's, that's absolutely true. right. So we could, so maybe, I mean, 
what I I want to go back to Julius for a second because Julius was a warmonger. Is that can we see that in this person's reigning ethos? Okay, so there's Cancer. We've got the Sun and Saturn. We've got all that stuff there. So there's a lot of activity. But yes, we can because the Moon's next application is to Mars. Nice. Yeah. What about? What about John Paul II? This this person was an institutionalist, a, con a conservative institutionalist who was absolutely um, adhered to the letter of the law. Moon, Saturn, square. I see Rain a lot of Mercury people. stuff pointing towards 12th house too. I don't really know what to make of that. Last chart, oh. this chart, and I think the, the libidinous guy too. Well, remember, we are talking about your your um, we are talking about a self undoing in this particular case, and so we could maybe look at how Mercury is in Taurus, and so a lot of a lot of what he did undid the reputation of both the church and him, especially after he died, especially after he like that whole. That everything that he let kind of slide with the with the the sexual abuse scandal, that tarnished both the church and him. And so we could see that maybe as a a rigid way of thinking about things, that then undid him. Yes. Yeah. Because in and this case. Note that I'm sorry, and also note that Mercury rules the twelfth from the ninth. The ninth being the church, so it undid him and the church. Ooh, that's cool. Definitely. Let's look at. Okay, we looked at Julius. We looked at. Let's look at. Let's look at Ram. Um, at Ramana Maharshi. See what he had to say. There's okay, Leona. if that's not a triangle, <coughs> I don't know what it. If what isn't? They're just green trines everywhere. I guess I'm just going to stop thinking they mean anything particular. Well, I mean, I mean, is this the the aspect of Jupiter, isn't it? What what chart are you looking at right now? Right now, Sri Ramana Maharishi. Uh huh. And so, which is the aspect of Jupiter you're talking about? No, the last. Well, so, okay, the last chart is the one I was like screaming about triangles, mm -hmm. but trines are considered you know how like oppositions are saturn's aspect oh yeah like jupiter or mars jupiter, jupiter yeah, is Ju a trine jupiter yes mm -hmm. okay so this is the ruler of the ninth is mercury what would their what would their belief be mercury is going to anything any aspect that mercury's making it doesn't look like it <laughs> so mercury is in jupiter's sign what is one of the things that Jupiter and Jupiter's in Pisces? One of the things, what are some of the things that Jupiter and Pisces do? Get drunk. Oh, I love that, but that's not something he would believe. <laughs> but what's another thing that what what does getting drunk do to you? Yeah, it's like that, like removal of <clears throat> I don't know. It intoxicates, so you get intoxicated. It puts you in another state. Yeah, like ecstasy, like religious ecstasy. Ecstasy, so that's a good one. I was also thinking of no distinction, right? Pisces is the opposite of Virgo, which is all about where everything goes. Yeah. The distinctions that you make. And so Pisces, Pisces. Yeah. Go ahead. Pisces is the, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's what people call Neptune is Jupiter and Pisces. Right. And so I, one of the questions that they asked Ramana Maharshi was, how should we treat others? And his reply was, there are no others. No distinction. Yes, dude. Dissolving boundaries. That is Neptune as fuck. Or Jupiter and Pisces. Yeah. I'm just saying, though, the concept exists in both uh, in both like stories. Hmm. So, I think that that might be where we're coming from, that the thinking is about how to transcend distinction. 
And he spoke like that too. Like very, you know, I hate to stereotype gurus, but like, shall we say abstract or less analytical well, speech patterns? Well, definitely. Remember one of the things, he was not like a great intellectual, right? We have, there are swamis that are in, great intellectuals and scholars. This is not one of the great, great scholars. <laughs> yeah, um, no, but probably a moving speaker or one who which like his speaking oh, absolutely. was a resource, a great resource of his. But remember the whole, his, most of his philosophy was around who are you, which which was about stripping yourself away from the stripping, stripping oh, away right. from, Duh. from, this is the new guy. Okay, from self-consciousness, right? So yeah. from self-consciousness. So I think in that respect, I mean, certainly the Mars Neptune as Mars is ruler of part of fortune makes some sense. Um, the Venus and Scorpio with the Venus as the self and, and Scorpio as what we, what we evacuate or get rid of. Um, but when looking at Mar Mercury and, oh, and who's the ruler of the second triplicity ruler? It's nighttime. So it would be Saturn. So Saturn is the ruler of the, so what this person would be very, very much a renunciate, wouldn't they? Saturn would be the second triplicity ruler meaning that it, representing the faith. So Saturn and Aries, this person would be, nothing is important. You know, there, no, nothing that you believe is important is important. Nothing you want, right? Saturn and Aries is nothing. You get, you get nothing. How did you get there? Sorry. Oh, the second triplicity ruler of the ninth house is your faith. And yeah, but how is Saturn and Aries nothing? Well, because Saturn, because what, ha what can happen with Saturn and Aries? Mm. issues with control mm, that's i mean that's nice and sweet but literally what can happen with saturn and aries what um, do we you... see when people... nothing what do we see when people have saturn and aries in the, in the seventh house nothing what do we see when they have saturn and aries in the fifth house nothing saturn and aries gives you nothing ah you just mean it's debilitative so there's no results no i mean that saturn and aries can't give can't produce He can't okay. produce. He doesn't produce. Right? It's Saturn detriment, already. right? Not fall. fall. It's, it's fall. fall. So fall does, okay, that doesn't make sense to fall. me. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense in general. I'm just wrapping oh, no, my head around care. it. No, no, no problem. Um, no, the, the issue is, think of it. Remember when we were, weren't we talking about this last week about the difference between Saturn and, and Aries and Saturn and Cancer? Or maybe that was on Thursday. And we were, it was, it was with Hanin. <clears throat> and she was talking about how she thought that Saturn and Cancer should be worse because it gets fewer points. You know, it gets minus five as opposed to minus four. And I was like, you know, that's okay. going to get you caught up because you don't get me started. Never made sense to me, but okay, yeah. Right. I realize a really close friend has Saturn Aries and she has a tough life. She's overpowered frequently by people around her. We were talking about this in Clubhouse, right? Yeah, okay, okay you were there. All right. And so, and I was saying, if Saturn's in Aries, nothing can happen. You can't move. It can't, right? Aries is the prima mobile, right? You can't move. Nothing can happen at all. Saturn in Cancer, that means that your emotions, you don't have the flow of emotions, right? You can't, the, the emotions are what are incapacitated. But if it's in Aries, everything is. And so it's, in my opinion, like I said, especially if he's retrograde, you can expect almost nothing. That's one of those places where, like when we talk about karma that can't be changed, Saturn retrograde and, and fall, that's that's one of those karmas that probably can't be changed. So that's why I'm saying, but, but we can see it in a good way because Saturn in Aries as a belief system means nothing. I want nothing. I can have nothing. I want nothing. Nothing is of any value. Everything is lead. Everything is dark. Everything is shit. And it's all the same. It's all the same. The shit is the same as the gold. You put gold leaf on a plate, put shit on a plate, I'll eat both of them. Saturn. That's the true, that's the two tantric, right? That's one of the last things that they do to a tantric is they have them eat feces to show it's that there is no connection there's no connection to anything to the senses. They cancel of, each other out, right? 
Because Mars that? makes things go faster and Saturn makes things go slower and it's just nothing. It just cancels <laughs> out. It can't do it can't do anything. I think uh, because Aries is a sign where it's usually associated with things beginning, but yeah. things cannot begin when there is something as restrictive as Saturn being there. That's right. Nothing mm. can start. Nothing can start. It was so the beginning. So okay. we see this okay. whole group. We see this whole group of people who are born with Saturn and Aries. And they all have, you know, where and you you'll see it all the time, wherever that is, they're, they're, they've got this major complaint. It's a karmic, it's a karmic condition. <coughs> it's a generational karmic condition. Like that. Like off the, off the top of your head, what else could be a karmic condition like that? Oh, well, I mean, it well, obviously any Saturn. Um, but any, any Saturn. Planet, uh, but any planet, any planet that's in retrograde or detriment indicates a karmic condition, in my opinion. Oh, well, yeah, I have. So my natal Venus is retrograde, cadent and combust. I've Ooh. never been in a long term relationship. Right. And I'm so that's you. OK. And, and you may yeah. and that might be the Adrita karma. That might be karma that can't be changed. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I'm not saying the planet yeah. is the karma that cannot be changed. Yes, exactly. Now, once again, what did I say? Everything, in my opinion, these days is about figuring out what kind of karmas we have in each area of life hmm. yeah. right so there i'm not saying that all karma can't be changed i'm saying there's dridda a dridda and dridda a dridda there's karma that can karma that cannot karma that it, that some of which can and some of which can't i think one missing aspect too because i don't i personally don't follow it too much because i'm still looking just at charts needle charts is that the fact that not all aspects of your chart are unfolding at the same time with the very same good. emphasis. Yes, so like I, for good. example, right now, I'm sorry, I keep bringing myself up, but it's an easy example. I'm in a, I'm in a Venus perfection year, a ninth house Venus perfection year. I've been studying a lot. I've been on a, more dates than I usually go on. They've all been disasters, but I'm dating. Yeah, I'm trying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we see the ninth house and the Venus happening. Yeah. We see I mean, both they, they show up even if they're not strong. <laughs> yeah, we see. Yeah. So we see both. Exactly. And they show up. They show up to prevent to provide the challenges necessary. Yeah. Right? Like when so I tried to get fresh with me and I started learning like how to deal with that. OK, perfect example. And once again, here in this particular chart, we've got the sun applying to the Saturn. We've got that mixed mixed mutual reception between the sun and Saturn, which helps this Saturn, right? So between the 11th, which might have something to do with why this person was so well known, and the fifth and the fourth, right? And people came, people came to his home, you know, to, to for that. So, <clears throat> um, but that's, but so uh, in my opinion, that's that's one of those things to be looking at. But ultimately, if we see stacked significations on a planet, if a planet is, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share for right now, unless you have more questions about that. Um, if a planet is, like you said, combust, retrograde, cadent, squaring Saturn, let's, let's add that, squaring Saturn. That, um, she's conjunct, opinion, she's conjunct, baby. <laughs> okay, conjunct Saturn. Okay, conjunct to malefic. That all of that stuff, in my opinion, points to a karma that will be difficult to change. Now, all of that will point to it. And ultimately, you know, when we had our conversation on Thursday with Esther and and the, the other people, I think Araya was there for a bit and Shanice. Um, one of the things that came up for me was me talking about how I look at the chart, you know, the difference between how people look at charts and like what my actual idea of looking at the chart. And I can honestly say, I read for people every month, you know, I read for people, you know, I read for at least two or three people a month. Every time I read a chart, that person, I'm finding that person in the middle of something, in the midst of something going on with them. And usually it's something that they're not happy with and something that they might not be able to change. And so 
it, and it's every it's every chart. It's every person. There is no person. Now, of course, maybe you can say people coming to you for a chart reading, they're coming because there's stuff that they want to work on was, or whatever. I was right? about to ask about that. <laughs> right. But but there hasn't been a chart that I've read. And remember, I told you about the chart I had of the woman where she, she didn't say a thing. She said like three words practically the entire time. Um, but there hasn't been a chart where I haven't walked into a quandary. Maybe that's the nature of your chart too. You ever think about that? No. Your Mercury ruled, right? Yeah, but I mean, but my life isn't really, I don't really have a lot of quandaries going on in my life. No, I think you like quandaries. I think the Oh, you think I attract you think I attract my chart. I mean, that could be well, here's or not something even your that chart is you you look, there's like that's what you want, I think. I think you're I think you're very intellectual. You like puzzles. You like oh, people puzzles. Who are, Mm, yeah. So I track puzzles. Um, I, well, certain, well, that's certainly, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that that's not the case, but I certainly don't attract anything that kind of reflects my actual circumstances. You know what I'm saying? It's like, where ah. it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, I feel like when you're saying, yes. oh, it's something that reflects your chart, it's something that no, usually. No, no. Might... I think it reflects your ascendant, which is what you're, you're, what reflects your needs in life, which are to have your intellectual needs met. You need Got to it. think. I think. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, oh fuck, shit. You just made me forget what I was gonna say. God no, no, no. You're saying you were speaking to someone, she wasn't saying much. Oh no, 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 no. I'd I'd moved on from that. I was gonna oh, say I'm sorry. Uh, you, were, you were talking about um wait, wait, let me just let me just get back. Uh we were discussing we were the karma that we can change and karma that we cannot absolutely change. Oh, so you attract people in the midst of something. 